Brooklyn Independent Television. Coming up on Health Beat Brooklyn. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. And wash your hands again. Advice on how to defend yourself against the flu epidemic, like if you have to sneeze. So what I try to tell them is just the Dracula. And debunking the myth that getting vaccinated can give you the flu. I took the vaccine and I got the flu. Impossible. At Kings County's Cardiac Cath Lab, we're going down the tubes. We're going to get the procedure started. You'll see how catheterization plays such a huge role in the health of Brooklyn's heart disease patients. This technology allows us to see where the blockage is. And February is American Heart Month, and American women need to pay as much attention as men do. So why is it that everybody thinks that men die of heart disease and women don't? We know that, in fact, uh, heart disease is the number one killer of women. All this and more on Health Beat Brooklyn. Welcome to Health Beat Brooklyn on Brooklyn Independent Television. I'm Dr. Monica Sweeney. Across the nation, this has been one rough flu season, and it's not over. The Centers for Disease Control says that while the numbers have started to level off in the East and the South, they're still rising in the West. The percentage of flu-related hospitalizations and outpatient visits both qualify as an epidemic. And while there are no nationwide systems to accurately count flu-related fatalities among adults, the number of children who have died is now approaching 40. What makes this flu bug, or rather bugs, plural, so bad? And what can you do to help protect yourself and your loved ones? Here to discuss the situation are Dr. George Allen, PhD, Director of Infection Control at SUNY Downstate Medical Center, and Dr. Nicholas Vacari, Assistant Director of Emergency Medicine with New York Methodist Hospital. Thank you both for joining me. Thank you. So let's just talk about the bug and what you've been seeing. In the emergency department at New York Methodist Hospital, we've seen almost a 20% increase in flu-like illness admissions to our emergency department since probably around the 20th, 21st of December. And it has stayed, uh, sustained a, a volume of 20% increase over what we usually see since uh, just up until about last week, where we're starting to see that fall off. It's, it is starting to level it's off. It's definitely starting to level off. So my other question about the volume is, are you seeing the usual presentation or are there various presentations of whatever these bugs are? Well, we are seeing a combination of both. Uh, we are seeing a, the usual flu-like symptoms, sore throat, fevers, uh, generalized aches and pains. We are also seeing uh, almost some gastroenteritis uh, uh, symptoms. Would you just talk, just explain gastroenteritis Absolutely. symptoms? Absolutely. So people who feel uh, a certain amount of nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, aches, pains. Just and it's not the usual coughing thing then, it's all... Correct. Correct. Stomach and intestines. Correct. Well, it must be really different when we're talking about inpatient. What are you all doing? The admission process, again, um, generally, if patients um, have comorbidities uh, with the influenza, uh, the typical symptoms are fever, um, very high um, fever, and aches. They may also have some other comorbidities that require them to be admitted. And that's when generally they're admitted. Uh, generally, we don't admit patients who just has the flu. Right. Um, usually would, um, you know, give them uh, some medication and send them back home. What kind of precautions are you taking, though, once you do have to admit, admit somebody who... Well, the precautions are taken even before we admit them. You know, um, typically, um, droplet isolation precaution is, is the category that is used. Um, I to love your term, droplet precautions, <laughs> but we're going to have to break it down break a little bit. Break it down a little bit. Uh, yeah. Basically, as you all know with flu, um, uh, when people cough and sneeze, you expel large amount of these um, particles. They land on surfaces, so these are droplets that land on surfaces, and an individual who touches this, they picked it up in their fingers, 
or it may actually land on a mucous membranes, which is your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. Also, if you touch one and you touch your nose and the mouth, that's how you get transmission of the influenza virus. So the precaution is droplet precaution, meaning that you're trying to control the spread of droplets. So, so all those people that are coughing next to you on the subway. And cover your nose and sneeze when you're coughing. And I know the Department of Health has a wonderful program where you sneeze and cough in the crook of your arms. And I'm sure my colleague here has some <laughs> wonderful... Way to uh, remember that. Yes. Sure. Yes, I would well, like you to tell us what that is. You know, a lot of times, uh, a lot of the treatment uh, is focused around symptoms. And what, you know, we do in the emergency department is a lot of education especially with pediatrics. So what I try to tell them is just the Dracula. Put the uh, Dracula cape right up to the... I love the right Dracula up to the cough. move. But Can I know, see you do it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing that you said is a lot of what you do is education. And so what we want to do is to make sure we spend enough time talking about what people should do before they get the flu, and maybe it will help them not get the flu. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the education. Let's I think start with what... To keep as simple as possible. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. And wash your hands again. And wash your hands. And, and you know, you could also use the alcohol preparations that you can buy in the drugstore. And, you know, consistently throughout the day, keep in mind that the things that you're touching, many other people have already touched. Touch, right. And those germs are being circulated throughout our community. And by washing your hands, you're protecting yourself and you're protecting your neighbors. So that's... Hand washing is a big deal. Right. Not what else can for, they do? Not only for the flu alone, hand washing is absolutely important for the tr uh, preventing the transmission of any kind of infection. But specifically for the flu, what you as an individual can do or should be doing every single year is getting vaccinated every single year. Well, There's I'm glad you said that. a different vaccine every year. Um, and you need to get that vaccine every single That's the most important thing you can do. Do you know that the percentage of people who should get vaccinated and the percentage who do differs by about 65%? Only about 35% of people who are indicated to become vaccinated. What do you hear as the reason that people give for not wanting to get the vaccine? I think the most popular response that I get is that I don't want to get sick today. So they don't want to take that flu shot that day because tomorrow they have a presentation at work, they have a very important meeting, they have the kids to drop off at school, and you know, there are a myriad of excuses that people will use. Why do people say they don't? What else have you heard? Well, again, um, one of the things that I hear all the time is that I took the vaccine and I got the flu. That same in this modern the times same is impossible. Uh, the, the vaccine that is formulated, that is used most often, the intramuscular uh, vaccine that is administered in the deltoid region of your arm, is a killed virus. Killed virus, absolutely. You tell Cannot people that over cause. and over again. Right. But you mention right. injection. Right. People sometimes, as a matter of fact, I will just tell you, the person that I know, um, I've, I think I've only had one person faint on me when I gave them an injection, and he was six foot five. My exam room could barely hold him. <laughs> there are people who are phobic about needles, needles, but we have a solution for that, right? Right, right there's the intranasal. It, the intranasal. Right. And so and the intranasal should be offered to people who are phobic about needles if you are over two and under 50. So there you are. For what? all of you who are phobic about needles, you can take the flu mist that is a spray into the nostrils. Right. What else do people say? What else I you? never get a cold. You ever hear people say that? I never get a cold, I don't need it. I don't need is, a, is also a, a very popular excuse for not getting the flu vaccine? I also hear is that uh, the flu vaccine is not effective. Mm -hmm. um, there was data from the CDC and New York State put that data out also that the flu vaccine is about 65% effective. Um, so if you do get the flu vaccine, 
65% of you will get adequate protection. The important thing for people to remember is that it takes time after you get the vaccine before the protection begins or kicks in. So where we are at this point with the uh, epidemic sort of on the wane and we've had a lot of the flu season has come and gone, is it still advisable for people to take the vaccine or the flu miss? Absolutely. Absolutely. So a lot of times you'll see two different, um, almost a bimodal transmission. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised that towards the beginning of spring if we would see a, another resurgence of this flu or maybe very similar flu to this. In fact, you can see cases up until May, probably. Absolutely. So people should know that if you've not done what you should, go and do it now because right. it can still be protective after and vaccines are two available weeks. Mm -hmm. and vaccines are available correct mm -hmm. the other point that we need to make sure we clear up is that the flu vaccine may not protect you completely but it does for people who get it um still have benefit could mm -hmm. you talk about that a little bit well you know i think that the benefits by far outweigh the risks. And when making decisions about just about anything in life, you have to weigh those two. Right. And you know, even though, like the doctor said, it's 65% effective, and you may have had an anecdotal story about a family member who took it and got sick anyway, the chances of you having a better outcome, becoming less sick, and less likely to transmit that virus around the community are greatly reduced by getting the, uh, the, the vaccine. Because vaccine. Right. some of the complications of flu, right up to and including um, pneumonia and hospitalizations sure. are very serious and the flu death. helps, including death, helps to protect you. And one last thing that uh, we have in the minute left, what about the people who say, I don't go out during the winter, I never go into crowds, I never go anywhere. Mm -hmm. I stay home, I'm the grandmother, I don't go out, my children do all the going out sure. for me. So what about them? What can we tell them? Well, we could tell them that, uh, that their life is, they think it is not in a bubble. That's right. And they are exposed. And really, just like I said earlier, is that we saw the amount of people that came into the emergency department at New York Methodist Hospital was dramatically increased that, you know, we had to actually open up some of the floor and the clinics upstairs that greatly helped take that burden off the emergency department. So it is there. The numbers are there. Go get the flu shot. Don't worry about who you're coming into contact with. You will be exposed by your grandkids, by your children, you Come by your visit. friends, yes. <laughs> by taking the subway, by turning doorknobs, whatever it may be. Go get the flu shot. Right. I think we're going to leave it right there. Good place to leave it. Thank you very much. Thank you. February is American Heart Month, and we want to devote our next two segments to heart health care. Coming up, We'll talk to a cardiologist about the broader picture. But first we bring you inside a specific and very important cardiac service offered by one of our leading Brooklyn hospitals. Do you know why you were asked to come over here today? Well, I was sent over from the cardiology clinic and they told me that I had a uh, positive stress test. And so they sent me here for further studies. Okay, have you been having any chest pains before they did the stress test? I have been. Past couple of weeks I've been having uh, some chest pains while walking. Do you have any risk factors that you believe could have put you at risk for possible heart disease according to what they could have told you in the clinic? Well, I'm sure my diabetes is probably one factor. Uh, I do smoke occasionally and uh, I do have a family history of heart disease. Do you believe that you are physically active or, or you live a sedentary life? Well, I don't exercise as often as I should. I don't exercise at all, really. So. Okay. All right. Because you had the chest pain and you had risk factors for heart disease and they did a stress test for you which was abnormal, there is a strong likelihood that you may have a type of heart disease we call atherosclerotic heart disease, which means that there may be a blockage in your arteries that supply the heart muscle. Mm. The reason why you're here today is to do something we call the angiogram. The cardiac catheterization laboratory is, a, is an area of the hospital where we do 
diagnostic test that tells us whether a patient has clogged arteries or not. There are a number of procedures that we can do over here, the commonest of which is the coronary angiogram, which looks at the arteries that feed the heart muscle to see whether there's any blockage or not. Okay, Mr. Johnny, we're going to get the procedure started. Like I mentioned to you, the first thing you're going to feel is a needle stick, which is the anesthetic in the skin. And after that, you shouldn't feel anything. This is a procedure where we go into the patient through either the groin or the arm by putting what looks like an IV, but we call it uh, a sheath or a catheter. We put that in the big artery in the, in the groin or in the wrist, and then we thread a very tiny catheter through that big artery all the way back to the heart. And then when we get to the heart, we inject something that looks like water, but we call it a dye because it's an X-ray contrast. When that material goes into the arteries, it makes them dark on X-ray. And we can see the arteries like branches of a tree, and we can tell whether those arteries are clogged or clean. This is uh, like an X-ray picture of a patient's heart looking at the arteries. Over here is the tube, what we call the catheter that takes the dye to the patient's heart. Now, as we look at the frame by frame in this artery, we can see this string appearance right here. This artery is supposed to be as fat here and as fat here should be the same diameter right here. Over here, there's a clog artery in the second obtuse marginal branch of the circumflex artery. And we can see it as a place in real time. You can look over there. That's exactly where the blockage is. So the kind of clog arteries that we're talking about, this is the way it looks on angiogram. You know, this technology allows us to see where the blockage is and it can let us plan how to unblock that blockage with an angioplasty and stent. We know the risk factors for heart disease. Some of these risk factors we can modify, some of the risk factors we cannot modify. But the things that we can modify are factors like diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, cigarette smoking, being overweight, sedentary lifestyle, or sometimes type A and aggressive personality has been shown to be related to heart disease also. So for people to really uh, reduce their risk for heart disease, these factors have to be taken care of. As we observe American Heart Month in February, we want to focus on heart disease and women. In popular culture, it's men who have heart attacks. Think of Marlon Brando in The Godfather, dying suddenly in his garden. But heart disease actually kills more women than men, and it kills more women than all types of cancer combined. Joining me to talk about this is Dr. Archana Saxena, a cardiologist from Lutheran Medical Center. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, so, you know, when I go out and give talks often, when I'm talking about many things and health, disease, health disparities and health disease and things come up between women and men, I ask the women in the audience, what is the number one cause of women dying? So what do you think they say? Cancer. Which cancer? Breast cancer, ovarian cancer. What, is the, what do women die from more frequently than breast cancer, for example? Well, we know that, in fact, uh, heart disease is the number one killer of women. So for one, about one in um, <clears throat> three women that will die this year will die from heart disease. What about can breast cancer? How many? One in what? One in 31. Women. One in 31. So, so we need some better education out there about the risk of heart disease in, in women. Um, so why is it that the whole, everybody thinks that men die of heart disease and women don't, pretty much? What, how did that get started? What's the basis of that? Well, there's, you know, the protection of estrogen that women have, and I think that has led a lot of people to believe that, you know, women are protected. Um, of course, you know, postmenopausal, that expires. But, you know, we've seen that even younger women are dying of heart disease, and that can be for many reasons. One, the metabolic syndrome. You know, that's a big problem today, society, um, being overweight, having abnormal cholesterol values, having problems with sugar, but maybe not fully diagnosed with diabetes, all these things, especially in women, are you know big causes of heart disease. And they're additive, aren't they? When you have the cholesterol problem, the 
diabetes, pre-diabetes problem, et cetera, they're additive. Absolutely. So having all three of them makes you more likely. Absolutely. What about smoking? Smoking, 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 smoking. If we could get everyone to quit smoking, it would be, it would be wonderful. Um, it's been shown in women that actually smoking affects them more and leads to more heart disease than the same amount of men who smoke. So that is the number one thing. If they could cut that out, It'd be wonderful. You know, um, we're going to get to what women could do and what people could do in general, but we're focusing on women for um, raising awareness about the fact that they do die from heart disease. So why do women not get the help that they need, even sometimes when they go to the emergency room? I think, you know, women, physicians, both sides of the equation, um, there's an underestimation of this disease. And so, you know, these symptoms, they often present late and they present atypically in women. So the classic chest pain, you know, pressure in the chest, that doesn't always happen to women. Um, the most what are their symptoms more likely to be? The most common thing that, you know, I think we see as cardiologists is fatigue or just a change in their activity level, subtle things that, you know, should raise concern for women. You know, usually multitasking, very busy, able to do many, many things, and they notice, I'm a little bit more tired than usual. I think that's a real big, big red flag for women. You know, I used to have women in my practice that I would do an EKG on and see clearly that they had had a heart attack and they had never been diagnosed. So would you talk a little bit, is it still called having a silent MI or undiagnosed? Would you talk about that a little bit because you touched on it with the symptoms? Sure, um, absolutely. I mean, it's these things that people think, oh, I'm just tired or, you know, I'm having a little trouble breathing, but I'm having a cold. You know, they attribute their symptoms to something else and they don't seek the help that they should have. Or, you know, again, it's missed at some level. And so they can have a, a silent heart attack. Um, and you're right, it can be picked up on EKG, it can be picked up up on a simple ultrasound of the heart. Um, so these things are really that women have to really be aware of and concerned and make sure they get checked and make sure they have regular visits even if they feel okay. I'm, I'm glad you said make sure you get a regular checkup, but my question is, and we're gonna get to the prevention, but what should you have done when you go for your annual physical when you were a woman um, seeing your internist or a primary care physician. Sure. What should a woman have done and what should be included in it? I think, you know, it varies with age, but number one, you should know your family history. You know, know if these diseases, anything, diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol, are in your family. And if that's there, you should tell your doctor, because it may lead, you know, the doctor to get you know, blood tests earlier that will look for these things, look for problems with sugar, look for cholesterol. Um, so, you know, if, if you're around 20, 25 years old and you have a strong family history, your parents have a lot of, you know, uh, risk factors for heart disease, you know, get checked, get your blood, blood test checked. Um, and, you know, we can do yearly EKGs as the older you get. And then if there's something that changes on that EKG, then we can surely get an ultrasound and, and start there. You know, the, when we were talking about risk factors, we didn't deal with obesity. Would you talk about how obesity is a risk factor and what we mean by obesity so we're all on the same page? Because a lot, there's a lot of denial going on about people who, in people who are obese. Sure. Yeah, um, you know, there, there are definitely a lot of tables out there, what's your recommended weight, et cetera, but, um, you know, being obesity has, has certain characteristics, a body mass index, um, it's greater than 30. So there are things that we look at, but also in general, just, you know, over time, if, if your pants don't fit, if you've noticed the scales have changed, you know, obesity has many different levels, and so I, t you know, tell people all the time, there, there are things you have to watch for, just weight changes, weight gains, um, instead of just focusing on one simple number. The other thing is, is the distribution of the fat. Would you mention that briefly? Sure. Um, women definitely tend to, to, to contain, you know, around their, uh, around their um, bottoms or around their abdomen. Men definitely around their abdomen, sometimes their thighs. Um, all of these areas, especially um, as we talked about the metabolic syndrome, are, are a big, um, uh, big risk factor, you know, and uh, can lead to all these other things that we talked about, blood pressure, the sugars being abnormal, and the cholesterol. So that's where we worry about the distribution being uh, more in, in, in this area, sort of the stomach, and like I said, the bottom and the thighs. You know, in the minute or so that we have left, you've already started talking about quitting smoking, top of the list. 
would you just go down the list and say what women can do to make sure that they have healthy hearts? Um, yeah, like absolutely. Smoking, number one, quitting smoking. Um, number two is exercise and regular exercise. So we recommend about 30 minutes a day. Um, you know, if you can at least do it three to four times a week, that's great. And moderate exercise. You know, I tell my patients where you can't sing. You could talk to someone, but you can't sing a song. So they know their heart rate's getting up and they're having a good workout. Um, the next one is, you know, obviously food, food choices. You know, we all know, I think we all know by now that to avoid fried foods and, you know, to, to choose grilled foods, baked foods, but also, you know, choose more poultry, turkey, fish, salmon, rather than red meat. Um, and of course, you know, try to choose um, healthier fats. You know, we're all going to have fat, but choose healthier fats, olive oil, um, things like that, as opposed to, you know, vegetable oil or, you know, baked goods have a lot of trans fats. Um, in addition to the, um, the diet, of course, uh, we, you know, stress, relief and stress. and that I'm glad you raised stress. It's, it's huge and it actually particularly affects women. So we really want to reduce the stress and we have so many ways to do that, especially in, in, in you know, the New York area. Yoga, Pilates, meditation. Um, Walking around the park. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, anything you can do to relieve stress. Go to a game at the New Barclay Center. You know, just have fun. And the, actually that's the last one, is to have fun. Um, if happiness and, 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 you know, showing gratitude, um, expressing your happiness, getting regular sleep, all of those things can lead to a healthier lifestyle. Thank you for including sleep. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. That's all for this month. To watch any of these segments again and to see all of our past Health Beat stories, go to brickartsmedia.org slash BIT and then click on Health Beat Brooklyn. And you can follow us on Facebook or Twitter on BK Independent TV. I'm Dr. Monica Sweeney. Thanks for watching and stay healthy. Watch this and other Brooklyn Independent Television episodes online at brickartsmedia.org slash BIT.